morning. Welcome everyone as we gather for worship on this sunny Sunday afternoon, our first Sunday in May. Oh, it's not afternoon, you're right, Justin. I haven't been up that long to make it the afternoon, I don't know where I was, but anyway, I'm back here, it's the morning. Welcome and good morning. Maybe that was a preemptive to those who are going to watch the service at some other time. It can be an, a good afternoon for them. Uh, as we gather for worship this morning, uh, we will be sharing in communion a little bit later on in the service. And so if you are at home and, and uh, have the ability to just prep some uh, food to partake in communion together with us, that we would be one as the body, um, despite being in different spaces, uh, that would be great. And also, if you are online with us right now and you do have any technical difficulties, please feel free to text 403 796 8213, and we'll do what we can to uh, get things fixed up for you. Uh, before the call to worship this morning, I would invite you to greet one another with a fist bump, handshake, whatever you're comfortable with or what each person is comfortable with. And so let's greet one another. For those of you online, feel free to welcome one another in the chat, and uh, we will begin the worship service in just a moment or two. If you're here in the sanctuary with us, by all means, feel free to stand if you like, or you can remain seated if you're more comfortable. Uh, the call to worship this morning is from Psalm 40, the first five verses. The writer says this, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places will become a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's worship the Lord today. Good morning. What do you uh, worship us as we start off with today?
share we're, the next song we're going to do is build my life and um, we're doing acts and in, in bible study group and uh, we did acts three and this is where peter and john uh, healed the lame beggar um, and the people were astounded and <laughs> um, peter and john's response was but um, this is in the name of jesus the same guy that they actually persecuted and yeah you know the rest of the story but um his response was but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom god raised from the dead from the dead to this we are witnesses and his name by faith in his name he made this man strong who you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man the perfect health in the presence of you all. And it just struck me that um, that night um, is if we really believe all the things we read in the word about Jesus. He is the author of life. Um, he is who he says he is. And that's why I decided to add both my life um, or we decided to add milk, build my life is because in the chorus it says, um, holy, there is no one like you. There is no one beside you. Open up our eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fold me. And this is our prayer when we sing build our life is for us to really grasp who Jesus is. And it's, it's, uh, it's also so cool at the end. They don't condemn the men who, uh, who persecuted Jesus and were actually guilty of getting him on the cross. Uh, they, la they later say, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. That time of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send, his Christ um, send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. So there's always a chance. We always have an, a new day, a new chance, a new page we can turn if we have stumbled and gotten far from the Lord. So repent therefore so that you may experience the refreshing from the Lord. So why don't you sing with us, Build My Life. Jesus 
none beside you. Please open up our eyes in wonder and show us who you are and fill us with your heart. Lead us in your love to those around us. We ask this all in your mighty name. Amen. morning. It's my, uh, my privilege to lead us in prayer this morning. The, uh, I say it every week, but I never know when we're going to have visitors here or online. We do have the, the prayer list on the website. If you aren't able to, to get that through the links in the, the emails, please touch base with Angie in the office and she can get you the password. Um, please, uh, Keep updated on that. We have people that need, really need prayer. And a lot of praises out there too. Please join me. Dear Jesus, um, thank you so very much for all that you are and all that you are to us. And Lord, we thank you for all that we mean to you. As we, we come to you today, we have we have exciting things going on in our lives. We have burdens that we're, we're carrying on our hearts, and you tell us to come to you, to share our, share our loads, to carry yours. 
as we come to you today. Um, Lord, I, I really want to lift up students as they're going into kind of the, the last couple of months uh, of school. And it sounds like there's all kinds of, of anxiety with exams and, and such. Lord, I want to lift up those who are hurting, uh, those who are, are sick, those who are recovering from, from operations and treatments. Lord, I pray your, your hand of healing would be upon them. As we go through our, our days and our weeks here, we pray for wisdom in our, our government officials that they would care for um, the people that, that they should be serving. Pray for governments around the world. There's, there's always unease somewhere. People are suffering, and we, we pray that you would be active, that you would be working in those situations and changing hearts, that those, those in the area would be able to reach out to people and to bring reconciliation, to introduce more people to you. Today, Lord, the sun's shining outside, and we thank you for that. Help us to see the blessings that you send our way, but help us to not forget about the many ways that you seek to use us to care for others. As we, as we gather here today, and Pastor Tyler comes to deliver your message, pray that that your spirit would would speak through him you would give him the words that you want him to say that you would um, you would open our ears that the spirit would interpret for us and that we would take to heart every word that you have for us today and all days Thank you, Jesus, that we get to come to you. Help us to praise you from the bottom of our hearts and to celebrate you today and every day. In your name, amen. Thank you to Tim and the worship team for leading us in worship thus far. Um, we, today we continue on in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're going to look at verse 4 and then verses 13 and 16. And later on in the message, we're going to jump over to 2 Corinthians. So if you're one who likes to have your Bible open, uh, warning, we'll be jumping to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 a little bit later on in the message. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 13 to 16. As Jesus began speaking, he said to his disciples, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hit, hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is God's word to us this morning. So as we continue on through the Beatitudes, and we'll be there, for, we will be here for some time, it's, it's important that we understand what it means, as in the English translation uh, gets used, the word blessed. Uh, we typically, generally, we think of blessed as, as in receiving something, someone blessed me with a gift. I've been blessed because of the life I've been able to live. And that is a true definition of blessed um, and blessing, most definitely. But it's a little bit more nuanced here as, uh, as uh, Jesus uses it when he's teaching his disciples. The word blessed here isn't specifically about something that someone receives, as in, in this case, blessed are those who are mourned, they will be comforted, 
you know, so those who are mourn, mourning will be comforted, and, and therefore that's a good thing to have, although that is true. What's bigger here is that this is what it means to live the good life. This is what it means, Jesus, in, in the entire Sermon on the Mount, or dis, uh, Discourse on Discipleship, as R.T. France calls it, is about what it means to be the people of God, to exhibit, to showcase, to live within the kingdom of heaven. And to be blessed is to live that good life, to live under the authority of Jesus in right relationship with God and right relationship with one another. And as you read chapters 5 through 7 here in, in Matthew, you will see time and again everything has to do with relationship to God or to one another. And Jesus, a little bit later on in, in uh, Matthew, or in, uh, later on in chapter 5, he talks about this issue of, you know, you've heard it say, do not kill, but I tell you even anger within your heart is like murdering another person. And you and I would be aghast at that because, well, unless you're someone who has no anger, uh, please teach me your ways. But I know for myself that there's all sorts of moments I have anger, and so by that accounting, I've killed a lot of people in my life. And so this all has to do with this relationship of what it means to be the people of God, what it means to live the blessed life, the right life, the good life with Jesus as King and within the body of Christ. Last week, we talked about humility, or to those who are poor in spirit, and that this is the life that Jesus led. He lived a humble life. He had to let go of his divinity, as Paul tells the Philippians, and come down to earth to enter into these frail bodies that we have, and to then give that life up again in order that we might be reconciled to God. And so, therefore, to be a disciple of his, to live under his authority, is to live a life of humility, to participate in his kingdom is to be a people who are humble. To surrender our will and our control for the life and the calling that Jesus has for us. And I quoted last week, although I didn't give the reference and I'll give it today, C.S. Lewis, who says to have humility or to be someone who is humble is to not to think less of yourself, to not throw yourself under the bus or think that you're a terrible or a horrible person or make yourself less than someone else around you, but to be humble, Lewis says, is to think of ourselves less often, to let go of the, our own desires for the desires and well-being of the other. And this week, as we talk about mourning and what it means to mourn, it follows in line, I mean, not chronologically, but to be humble is to also be mournful. To be humble and, and humility, these things go together, because to be mournful is to be vulnerable. To let go of any sign of uh, pride or, or things that we hold on to and to recognize that we hurt. And so the questions that I want us to examine are two that come right out of the passage. What does it mean to mourn on the one hand and what does it mean to be comforted on the other? And then finally I want to answer the question or attempt to answer the question, how does this bear witness to the kingdom of God as salt and light as Jesus, Jesus finishes the Beatitudes up with? What does it mean to mourn? In 2008, uh, and as I was writing this, I was tearing up a little bit, so I brought some Kleenex just in case uh, I start to lose a little bit of control. But in 2008, my mom passed away. Uh, she had cancer for a number of years, and she passed away. And we experienced, and I experienced, our family, Ange and I, and, and uh, the two older kids, Riley was just a baby at the time, and Tracy was within the womb. Um, but we experienced this profound sense of loss, sense of frustration, Knowledge that the kids wouldn't get to see, or grandma wouldn't get to see the kids as they grew up. Noelle at the time was in dancing, and she had just, I think either that year or the next year, entered into and was going to be doing a tap solo, something she had wanted to do for a long time, something my mom loved. My mom loved tap dancing. And I remember being at, in the university theater here in, in the city at one of the competitions as Noelle was performing her tap solo and just welling up with tears knowing that my mom was only here months earlier and wouldn't be able to sit and experience this together. Mourning is a sense of loss. It's a sense of grief. It's a feeling like things are out of control and the thing that I once had is no longer there and there's a hole that's developed as a result of it. But mourning, as Jesus talks about it here in the Beatitudes, is even bigger than that. It's not just the personal loss that I experience as someone uh, whose mom passed away. 
It's mourning in, as a beatitude, and for those who will be comforted, it's mourning when you see others and your heart breaks for others who, who are experiencing tough times. It's a mourning when you recognize that things aren't as they should be or could be. The mourning Jesus is talking about here is a mourning of a realization that things aren't right, that the system is broken. And that's bigger than my own personal loss. It's a loss we suffer together. After delivering a series of woes to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus interacted with these Pharisees and teachers of the law, and he saw the system broken, the burden they were placing on other people, the the weight of that burden that the people carried, Jesus' heart broke for them. And he wanted to gather them as a, as a mother hen gathers her chicks to protect them, to bring them in close, to say all will be okay. Jesus saw individual people out of whack, but in addition, he saw that the entire system was messed up. That there was no way to get ahead. That without him entering into the picture, the world had no hope whatsoever. They were a people lost and astray, or in his words, they were sheep without a shepherd, just as you and I are. To mourn then, in a kingdom sense, in this beatitude sense, in in the understanding of what it means to live the good life, is not only to experience our own personal loss and grief and suffering, but is to see other people and to share in their pain, to carry that mournfulness as well. For another person's pain to become your pain, for my pain to become yours, and for yours to become mine. Whether others know they're experiencing it or not. To see the difficulty of people not accomplishing what they want to accomplish, or the challenge of those who keep making the same mistake over and over again, and not changing plan. To see them and to look at them with a sense of care and mourning is what Jesus is trying to get across to his disciples here about what it means to live the good life, to be a part of his kingdom. And so that's what it means to mourn. The second question then is, what does it mean to be comforted? I'm going to use three examples again out of the life of, um, as my mom was passing away. When my mom was sick in hospital, this was kind of the final push. We had made the decision collectively as a family that the doctors and nurses and whatnot had said to us, this is kind of the end. Um, You know, the provide comfort care, you know, how much do we want to, um, you know, deal with life support and those kind of things. And we made the decision that, and which we knew my mom's decision was as well, that life, you know, unending life support was not her wish. Um, so she was sick in hospital and we knew she wouldn't be coming out, that this would be the end. And the first, uh, as I reflected on this, the first experience then of comfort was this. When the Goodwins called us, and said, we'll stay with you when my mom got right near the end. We'll come and stay at your house. And when you guys need to leave, you leave to go be with mom at the hospital, and we'll stay with your kids. And I remember them sleeping in our living room on uncomfortable couches and uncomfortable recliners. Tim and Lisa were there, or one of them at least, to say, when you need to go, you go. They drew alongside of us. They entered into our pain. They provided space for us to do what we needed to do for Angie and I to leave and go to the hospital to be with my mom in her final breaths and moments. They took the initiative to enter in, to provide comfort. They didn't take away the pain. They didn't make the pain easier. The loss was still upcoming and I was experiencing it. We were experiencing it. But they entered into it and shared that pain with us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mom passed away. And the funeral was arranged and whatnot, and uh, there was lots of people that attended. It was a small church just west of town in Springbank, and uh, my brother and my dad and Ange and I and the kids were all sitting in the front, very front row, like one of these rows here, this little tiny church, and people were gathering. We were there early, obviously, uh, before the service started, and 
Brad, the pastor, was taking care of things, and, and we knew the church was pretty full. Uh, my mom was young. She was in her 50s when she passed. And the service went through, and it was, it was great. I mean, as far as funeral services are, uh, when you've lost your, your mom um, or wife and whatnot. But we didn't, I didn't fully get a grasp on how many people were there or who was there. And many people I didn't know because it was friends of my parents, those kinds of things. Um, friends they had in Cochrane that we didn't really know. But as we were leaving, the service concluded and the pastor led us out first as everyone stood, as tends to be the tradition um, within how we celebrate funerals and memorial services. I got to the back and realized the church was full, the, the space behind the sanctuary was full, that there was people, it was standing room only, there was people downstairs who came and were there and didn't even get to participate in the service. I got to the end and to the doors, and this is where I might lose it, and three of my friends were standing there in that door, Jeff, Steve, and Rod. And I got there and I looked at them like, what are you guys doing here? I did not expect them to be there at all. But Jeff had lost his mom to a stroke a few years earlier. He knew the loss that I was experiencing. And he said to Steve and Rod, we need to show up. We need to be there. We need to enter into his pain. They didn't need to say anything. They didn't need to do anything other than to be present and to, for me to see the whites of their eyes as I came out of this space. They didn't take away the pain. They entered into it with us and they shared it. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. They entered into our space, entered into our pain, and carried it with us. Finally, a third example. In the days that followed, and, and really I have no recollection where this happened. Uh, Ange probably remembers it better than I do in terms of the details. But Ruth Longhurst and Shreen and Nathan, whom some of you, many of you will know, came to our house and cleaned it. Now, if you've ever been to our house, if if you want to experience something, just come to our house on a random day and you will see how we maintain our house, which is to say we don't really maintain our house. And uh, life had been busy and whatnot, and Ruth and Trina Nathan came over. Trina and Nathan had come down from Edmonton, again, to be somewhat present. I don't know if that was the full reason why they were in town. But they said, we're going to clean your house for you. We're going to do your laundry for you. And I don't have any clue where we went or what we were up to, but they were doing our laundry and vacuuming our floors. They had to go get our vacuum fixed because it would overheat um, if it was used for too long, which we didn't have that much problem because it didn't get overused too much in our house. Uh, but for them, as they cleaned it, uh, they did, and so they went and got that taken care of. Um, again, not expected from them, but they entered into our pain, and, and it, this is where it gets vulnerable because now people who are not our family in, in the traditional or in the, you know, we're friends, uh, we're cleaning my dirty underwear. We're seeing the mess that we live in. I mean, it's not, well, it is sometimes that bad. But Tracy is going to, this is a side note, Tracy's going to vacuum our house once a week for the next three months because that's how much she wants a dog. So, so the next three months, we could have a reasonably clean house. But they entered into this mess, this, and there was a, a, a humility that we needed to have, a vulnerability we needed to have for them to enter in. They didn't take away our pain in terms of the loss of my mom but they entered into it with us. They shared in it with us. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In all these examples and the numerous examples I could give going to other people's lives and other aspects within my lives, it's a matter of the community coming together, the people of God being together, entering into one another's story and life and challenge, being vulnerable and open with one another to care for one another, to carry the burden, to share in with it. But too often, we enter into mourning, we try to deal with mourning and try to receive comfort in ways that don't actually accomplish that. We sometimes deal with pain and, and loss with distraction and busyness. We just get preoccupied with stuff to do so we don't have to deal with it. Maybe in, in a really negative way, we might turn to, and, and we see this all the time in society and in movies and whatnot, we turn to drugs or alcohol to numb the pain, which are effective in creating a sense of peace or not having to deal with it at the moment. But they too will pass. Sometimes we deal with pain and loss by ignoring what's going on, not facing up to the reality of the situation. 
Those are other ways that we can try to deal with pain and suffering and loss. But it's not what it means to enter into the kingdom of God. It's not what it means to be His people, to engage together, to share and carry one another's burden, to be comfort in the biblical sense what Jesus is trying to communicate to His disciples is to deal with pain not by getting rid of it, but by entering into it and to know that you are not alone. The ways of the kingdom of heaven, the good life, the blessed life, is to deal with pain and loss not by eliminating it, but by knowing that it's shared with those around you. And in many ways, what Jesus is talking about here and which we looked at in Revelation is this big fancy word, eschatological point of view. That one day there will be no more pain. And we will not have to mourn because we will be eternally comforted, cared for. And we won't experience that loss anymore. But in right now, as Jesus was saying, as you follow me, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You are to be a people not only who shares one another's burdens and griefs and loss, but you're to enter into one another's burdens, griefs and loss, in order that we will be comforted right here and right now. Which brings us to the final question. How does this bear witness to the kingdom of God as salt and light? In that, I want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the first seven verses. As Paul's writing to this church, which he had a very rocky relationship with. They did not get along. There's all sorts of references throughout 1 and 2 Corinthians, recognizing Paul's difficult relationship with these turkeys. We could put in there the letter to Crescent Heights, or First Baptist, or Foothills Alliance, whatever other church you want to enter into. We all struggle with these things that the Corinthians were going through. And Paul writes to them saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church that he struggled with, was frustrated by, and who was frustrated by him, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble and with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are suffering, we suffer. Sorry, if we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope is for you, and our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also share in our comfort. Paul, writing to this church that he didn't get along with well, who had a difficult and challenging relationship with, says to them, we are entering into the comfort and care of one another because of the comfort and care that God has poured out in us and through us through Jesus Christ. And the only way to do that is to live as the body of Christ, to share in each other's lives, to draw close to one another. And so despite their differences, Paul was writing, Paul and Timothy were writing to them to say we need to draw close to one another, that the comfort we experience we might share with others and the comfort you experience you might share with others because all of us are going to go through suffering and loss. Whether that's personal loss through death or illness or uh, job loss, financial woes, or whether that's suffering and loss due to confusion and not knowing which end is up, the challenges we face, faith in our, face in our day-to-day lives together, the questions we have about God's existence and His presence in our lives or not to draw together as the community, to live in community together, to care for one another and carry each other's burdens, to comfort those who mourn, bears witness to the kingdom of God. Because the unity that we find united uh, through Christ alone demonstrates that no matter how different we are interpersonally, relationally, historically, socioeconomically, 
The unity of Christ draws us kept together and we can enter into each other's lives to share each other's, in each other's mourning and to comfort with the comfort that Christ has given us. To comfort the other is not to take away the pain, but to enter into it with them and to share it. And if you and I don't live lives together, if we don't share and be vulnerable with one another, we will never live into this good life that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples about. But you and I live in a culture that continues to scream independence and self-sustainingness. And I don't need anyone else to get in and understand how messy my life really is. But to live the good life, to follow Jesus, to be it. That's why I love R.T. France's message about this being the discourse on discipleship. To have Jesus' head and us be the body is to enter into each other's pain and loss and difficulty and to comfort one another, to see our messes and to help clean up, to see our loss and to help support to see our pain and say, I'm with you, my heart breaks for you as well. And so the question before us is, are you open to God working in your life? Are you open to letting go of our control, letting go of holding on to everything that we think brings comfort and to allow him through his people to do his work? Are you open to allowing others to enter into your life, to see your dirty underwear as it might be? And do you engage meaningfully in others' lives, not out of duty or obligation, but rather out of a genuine sense of care and comfort for them, to come alongside them and to walk with them as they experience grief and loss and the mourning that comes with it? Blessed are those who mourn, for when they are in the people of God, when Christ is rightly aligned with them, when they are rightly aligned and continuing to work on relationship with one another, they will be comforted and their light will shine before men and the kingdom of God will be made known. I invite the worship team up as we conclude our sermon together and prepare for uh, uh, communion. Please join me in prayer. But God, I thank you that you led us, that you entered in, that you took on a life of humility to come down to earth, to walk amongst us, and ultimately to live your life and give your life as a ransom for many. And so we pray, Lord, that you would continue to soften our hearts as we draw together as community, as we share one another's burdens, as we get involved in the messiness that we all experience in life. Allow us to have eyes to see and ears to hear that we might comfort one another that we would draw close and carry each other's burdens. We praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the love that you have granted us. Help us to live fully in the community in which you have placed us. Amen. You can remain seated, but join us in song as we sing, Lord, I need you as a prayer before communion.
This week, um, as I had mentioned last week, uh, at the end of May, our um, denomination is heading into what we call assembly, which is essentially a giant business meeting for a group of churches coming together, similar to what we do. Um, and at assembly, there's motions passed and budgets passed and all that kind of stuff, just like we do as a church uh, business-wise. And throughout this week, I've been, uh, Emmanuel Baptist in Saskatoon has a really great website where they, and they've done a really good job of kind of looking at the issues that are upcoming um, for our denomination. And they brought speakers in and whatnot. And so I probably get Ange to send out a link to that website this week in the email for us as a church. Uh, it's just, it's a great resource because there are a couple, there's an identity statement and whatnot um, that's caused some difficulty uh, throughout the denomination. And so all these things are going to be talked and, and navigated. And then we've appointed Jack and Laurel to go vote on it. So we kind of threw the burden uh, on them. But... Um, but one of the questions in the videos that I've been listening to and the books that I've been reading, trying to understand the issues and, and how to best navigate forward is, the question is, who is welcome to the table? I mean, that's not particularly what's going to be discussed at assembly, but that's kind of what sits in the background of all this, is who's welcome around the table to come and partake in the bread and the juice of Christ, the reminder of Christ's suffering and death, but also a foretaste, a pointing towards his return and one day bringing all things new, making all things new. And for us as a church, who we say is around the table is those who understand Christ as Lord and Savior to come, to partake, to proclaim as you eat the bread and the juice or the, again, whatever that little thing is in the cup uh, and the juice that you have with you. But it's those who are in Christ because it's those who uh, understand his death and his resurrection and what it means to live new, uh, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven. And we get that wrong all the time. The church has always gotten it wrong at some point. And Paul, in, the, in what we quote all the time as we come around the table, he's writing to, again, this group of Corinthians because they got it wrong. 
They were messing up. They were missing the point of what it means to come around the table. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings, when you gather as the church, do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it, no doubt, there have been divisions and differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. But when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you so despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in the Lord, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man or a woman ought to examine himself or herself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. We gather around this table to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, the gathering of his disciples to say, I'm going to fulfill the purpose for which I came, to lay my life down, to allow my body to be broken and my blood to be shed. Which is why when he took the cup, he, or the, took the bread, he blessed it, saying, this is my body. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, eat, eat all of it, for this is my body broken for you. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant. It is my blood shared that we might enter into life together, that you might be reconciled to God. And Paul reminds us that we do this, not only to remember what Jesus has done in us and through us and for us, but also to proclaim and anticipate his coming again. And so if you would, please join me as we pray together for the bread and the juice, and then we will take it together as one body. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the life you have given us. We thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. We know this week, Lord, in each of our lives, there have been moments and maybe long stretches where we have turned from you, where we're going through the motions, where we're not recognizing your lordship in our life. And for that, we repent. We let go. We turn it over to you again. We thank you for your grace that continues to abound, that despite our sin, your grace grows bigger. And so as we eat of this bread, and as we drink of this cup, Help us not only to remember, but to anticipate, to live in the covenant in which you have made through the shedding of your blood. And so we pray, Lord, you hear our confession and you remind us once again that we are yours, bought with a price and called to proclaim that the kingdom has come and that you, Jesus, are Lord and Savior. And so we thank you for this bread. We thank you for this juice and all that it represents. And as we share it together, we share it as one body, your body here in this place. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. As the worship team leads us in our final song, um, allow this to be your prayer. 
Allow this to be your refrain. Allow this to be your reminder of what we just participated in today. Would you stand with us as we sing Shah to the Lord? join me in prayer for the offering. Father God, we gather to worship and we give these gifts as a means and an act of worship to, uh, for you and to you for the work of your kingdom here through this church. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bless this offering, that it would go and be multiplied as needed, that we might be faithful to all that you've called us to do, to proclaim your kingdom and to make disciples as you have uh, called us to. We thank you for the gift of life and love and togetherness we have as the body of Christ with you as head. And so we pray that we would be good stewards of all the resources and people that you have brought together in this place. In your name we pray. Amen. If you'd like, by all means, have a, a seat. I just have a couple of announcements before the benediction. Um, Bible studies continue again tomorrow afternoon, the men's and women's, and then in the evening, uh, the Bible study is happening at the Goodwins house. Uh, so that is ongoing today. Uh, and I meant to mention this earlier, and I completely forgot, but we have a new Sunday school ministry starting uh, that started today. Wilma is leading a toddler group up in the nursery. 
Um, and so um, there's a number of kids up there, a number of people helping out with it. And so please pray for that ministry as Wilma leads that and gets it off and running um, as we care for these little ones that God has blessed us with. And finally, just to remember, uh, yes, to pray for our denomination, for us as a church, as we head into assembly at the end of the month. And uh, it, it's going to be an interesting season together. And so I pray that God's spirit, that we would be a people uh, collectively in Western Canada that would draw together uh, to comfort one another, to enter into space together, and to love as God has loved us. And so let's conclude our time together with the benediction. Father God, we thank you for the gift of life you have granted us with. We thank you for the community in which you've placed us with. We thank you with the word that you make so abundant to us here in this place. And so we pray that as we go out from this place, that your blessing, Lord, would be upon us. May the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you as you go out and make him known. Amen. Go in peace. Have a fantastic afternoon and week. Thank you.